Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone who has registered uh, for this webinar, which today will be practical applications of deep learning to imputation of drug discovery data. My name is John Norman and I'm the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, thanks again for joining us for what promises to be a tremendously engaging presentation. Okay, so uh, now it's time to hand over to our presenters, who today are our guest, Julian Lavelle, Vice President of Drug Discovery from Constellation Pharmaceuticals, and from Optibrium, our Senior Scientist, Ben Irwin, and our CEO, Matt Siegel, who will host today's proceedings. Uh, Matt, I will now hand things over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the introduction, John. Uh, so my name is Matt Siegel. I'm the CEO here at Optibrium. Uh, I know many of you in the audience, so it's good to speak with you again. And thanks to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. It's my great pleasure to welcome both Julian and Ben to the webinar. Uh, first of all, to introduce Julian. Uh, Julian is Vice President of Drug Discovery at Constellation Pharmaceuticals, uh, based in Boston, the United States. And he has overall responsibility for small molecule research efforts covering a wide range of disciplines, including medicinal, chemistry, molecular modeling, structural biology, and so on. Julian has a, a long career in the pharma industry, over 20 years, uh, with organizations like uh, Rolplan Rohr, Aventus, Sanofi, Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, and uh, most recently joined Constellation in 2016. It's been a great pleasure to collaborate with Julian uh, for almost a decade now uh, at Novartis before he moved to Constellation. Um, and I just thought before we get started with the uh, main presentation uh, about uh, deep learning, uh, it would be great if you could give us a little bit of background uh, about Constellation um, and also the, the projects that we'll be discussing in the course of today's presentation. So over to you for a minute, Julian. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, as Matt said, I'm at Constellation. We're a biotech company based around Boston area in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we, we started in 2008, and our main focus has been in chromatin-related proteins, looking at uh, protein families that either place marks or erase marks or read the marks on, on the histone tails of chromatin in order to inform or control gene transcription. Um, our main focus has been in oncology, although there's as many other applications of this, and in which case we're mainly looking at tumor cells as well as, as cells of the immune system, like T cells and, and myeloid dis displays, myeloid dis suppressive cells. So we have a um, number of programs in the clinic. Our uh, EZH2 inhibitor is in phase two, looking at prostate cancer. We also have a BET inhibitor in phase two, looking at myelofibrosis. We also have a second generation EZH2 inhibitor, CPI0209, which is currently doing dose escalation. Um, as well as that, we have other preclinical pre assets. We have a LST1 clinical candidate compound, as well as a CBP P300 hat preclinical compound. And apart from that, are a broader portfolio of, of projects as well, which are currently undisclosed. One of those is the program, one of the programs that we collaborated on with Octibrium, and the other one is the CBP HAP program. So this is a, just a very brief uh, overview of the data that Ben's going to talk through. Um, the first pro project we collaborated with was the CBP HAP program, which was essentially complete at the time we began the collaboration, mainly with the uh, understanding of looking at real-world data sets with the Alchemite approach. Um, so there was a few additional molecules and data that we gathered while we were collaborating on this, but mostly there was about 1,300 molecules with full data set already available. And the second program is an undisclosed program that we still haven't um, release that we're working on, and so I can't really give too much details on that program, other than to say that at the beginning of this collaboration we had a few hundred molecules, and we made another about a thousand molecules during the course of the program, which were iteratively updating the data sets and trying to improve the models and, and see what the impact was. Uh, we didn't disclose any structures. That will be something I'll come back to, cycle back very quickly at the very end, but we shared the star drop molecular descriptors full uh, as well as all the bi 
biochemical cellular anatomy data for all molecules that we had. Um, just if anybody's interested, a lot of the CBP hat chemistry has been published pretty recently, as well as one that went online last week discussing CPI 1612, which is one of our most advanced compounds in the, in the HAP program. So if you want to see some of the structures, even though we didn't share them during this collaboration and we don't have any structures in the, in the, in the presentation, there is some publications there that you can go and take a look at with uh, pretty recently published. I think that was it from our perspective, my perspective at the moment. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Julian. Um, so, having given you that little bit of background, um, I'm going to hand over to Ben. Uh, so, just to give you a few words of introduction, uh, Ben is a, a senior scientist here at Optivrium. Uh, he's responsible for uh, developing and applying new algorithms to drug discovery. Uh, before joining Optibrium, he did his PhD in theoretical physics at the University of Cambridge. And in particular, and the reason he's presenting this today, is he's responsible for our project collaborating with Constellation. And he's going to tell us more about practical applications of deep learning to imputation of drug discovery data. So over to you, Ben. Thanks a lot, Matt. And thanks a lot, Julian, for the introduction there. Um, so I'll give an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first thing is problems with pharmaceutical data. Pharmaceutical data has its own uh, quirks, and that can make it hard to model. And we'll discuss what these problems are and how a solution to the problems would look. We're then going to talk about the Alchemite method, which we use for this particular project. And that's a novel deep learning method for imputation. So for the purposes of um, translating the word imputation into more meaningful uh, words, filling in the blanks is a good substitute. Um, then we're going to look at the walkthrough of uh, applying Alchemite to this real project data that Julian introduced, and that's from Constellation Pharmaceuticals. And that covers early stages in those projects, um, some validation of the models uh, throughout the projects, and then uh, late stage models. And we compare those models with uh, standard quantitative structure activity relationship methods, QSAR methods, throughout. And then at the very end of the talk, I will talk about a larger application of uh, the Alchemite method and the future prospects. So first, let's discuss the difference between a prediction model and an imputation model, because there's a subtle change here, um, and it's best to, to, to make it clear. So a prediction model, a lot of people will be familiar with from QSAR modeling, it, it takes a set of input features and it will predict one or more property value for compounds in the case of drug discovery. So that might be on the left of these two pictures. We've got rows, which are compounds. Each compound has multiple descriptors in the orange box. Those go into an algorithm such as a random forest algorithm depicted here and outcome predictions for a number of different assay endpoints. Uh, those are the columns in that purple box there. Imputation goes a bit beyond this because often we have um, already measured some experimental data throughout our project and it would be a shame not to use that to make even better predictions if that's possible. The problem is that this is normally in a sparse data format depicted on the picture on the right as these sparse green squares. Not every experiment has been done for every compound. Um, so an imputation method would be one that takes that experimental data and fills in the blanks, the white space in that grid to give a, a matrix of, of measured experimental values in green and predicted experimental values in purple. So the Alchemite method is an example of an imputation method and it's going to use both descriptors and partial experimental information to make predictions. Let's go through the problems with pharmaceutical data. I've boiled the problems down to four main categories here um, that I found for a machine learning method to be practically useful in these QSTAR type applications. It should be able to handle missing values, noisy data, multiple endpoints, and data changing with time. And if you have to assign a single word to each of those, it would be sparsity, uncertainty, heterogeneity, and temporal. Let's go through each of these in a case-by-case -case basis. 
the missing values in the uh, context of an imputation type algorithm, any algorithm that we make is essentially a function. Here you've got some y, the thing we want to predict, is a function of some x's. But if those values are missing, when we come to call that function or evaluate the mathematical expression, you can't enter nothing. It won't make sense for the algorithm to evaluate those missing values. Right. And many of our data sets look something like that on the right here. We've got compounds, we've got various columns, but some of those uh, data points just aren't there. There's question marks. So there are simple ways to try and get around this. You could impute using the mean value, for example. You take the average value in a, compound, in a column, and you put that in as a substitute for the missing value. But in general, that doesn't give a good um, approximation of the function value that you're trying to predict. So any solution to this is going to have to make use of those sparse values where possible and make sensible predictions for the missing values. Noise and uncertainty comes in in two ways. You've kind of got input uncertainty as well as output uncertainty. Now the problem with pharmaceutical data is it's inherently a lot more noisy than other data types that deep learning and other machine learning methods are used on. Measuring biological assays, there's going to be a lot of variability depending on the assay conditions. Um, <clears throat> and the input data may not actually be true in that aspect. So if you fit it too strongly, you're going to get uh, overfitting, you're going to get uh, the wrong answer. Um, and the other side of that is the output uncertainty, where models are often outputting numbers with no context. If you look at the two plots on the right here, the top plot, um, has data points with no error bars. If this was a prediction for some assay as a function of some descriptor, we might see a sort of trend forming. If you look at the same plot with error bars on those predictions, you suddenly see that this trend is misleading on the right end, um, on the right side of that descriptor. And actually the most uh, accurate data point is this uh, one with the smaller error bar down here. So any solution needs to account for input noise and output noise. Um, it should not fit too strongly to the input data, and predictions should definitely have confident values, where a large confidence um, is, is to be trusted and, and weak predictions are, are not so useful. In terms of multiple endpoints, in pharmaceutical data, there's many different aspects uh, and many different assay types. You're going to then generally have activity columns, but these could be IC50s or EC50s. You can measure them for protein assays or for more complex tissue and cell assays. Um, and there might be multiple targets in, in a project, some of those related and correlated and some of those unrelated. Um, there will also be more complex and sometimes more expensive endpoints, such as ADMI uh, endpoints. These could be plasma protein binding, intrinsic clearance, SIP inhibition, or physical chemical properties, permeability, solubility. Ideally, we could have a single model that handles all of that, um, all as one input. Noisy, fragmented data goes in, something complex happens inside, and we receive individual predictions for all of our endpoints with tailor-made error bars for each of those predictions. The final point is that the data change with time. The data are evolving as the project continues. The chemical space is being explored. The activity will change as well. You might have more active compounds towards the end of a project as there's been more successful um, leads. The data sparsity will change. You generally get more ADMI data for more promising compounds towards the end of the project and you'll have less ADMI data in these high throughput early stage screening. <clears throat> Any solution would be a model that extrapolates well, as well as um, is quick enough to retrain as you get more data, and the model should be temporally validated. Okay, let's talk about Alchemite, which is a method for deep multiple imputation. So Optibrium has an exclusive collaboration with Intelligence in the sphere of drug discovery and small molecule applications. Intelligence produce a piece of software called Alchemite, which is a sophisticated deep imputation platform. And we've partnered with them 
um, in for a number of applications now. Uh, there are two main publications at the moment. Um, the one on the left is more technical and gives an overview of the Alchemite method. And it's good to refer to this if you've not already seen this publication. Uh, the reference is here. And then there's a, a newer uh, future drug discovery paper that gives a broad overview on the differences between uh, prediction and imputation that's an interesting read as well. So what is Alchemite? Alchemite is a method for deep multiple imputation that was originally used to design new materials in the University of Cambridge, UK. It successfully designed jet engine alloys and identified errors in uh, large materials uh, databases. And we've been working with intelligence to optimize this algorithm and apply it to drug discovery data. The algorithm has a deep neural network inside. I've called this DNN of X, and X is the input descriptor vector, and it's also got this sparse assay data as well. Instead of solving the equation Y equals X, uh, sorry, Y equals F of X for some function Y, instead we want to solve for the completed data set. So we've got the equation here, X equals F of X, um, which is imputation, and that takes the form of this thing called a a fixed point iteration equation. Um, and the deep neural network that's going to be used to solve that has a number of parameters. It's got weights uh, and biases and hyperparameters as well, such as number of layers and the size of the layer, the activation function. The really elegant solution for the Alchemite method is we take that complicated function and we put it into this process on the right <coughs> as this f of x. So that takes the function along with a uh, input that we want to evaluate it for. And it first checks whether all of those inputs are present. If they're all present, we can use that function uh, in the standard way. We call its value, we get the value out. If they aren't present, we need to substitute them with something, uh, an initial guess. For that initial guess, we can use the average value of the column, for example. Then this goes through this uh, iterative process here until we reach some definition of convergence where we mix the output of the algorithm with the previous input to some fraction. Once it's gone through that cycle, then we can uh, get a, a better prediction for the, the function value at the end. So for some people who are uh, familiar with recurrent neural networks, this might look a little bit familiar. If this is a differentiable process, you can use gradients to train this network. And if it's not differentiable, there's other algorithms such as expectation maximization that can help train this. The good thing about Alchemite is that you can get an error bar out of it by using this ensemble technique. If you think about a small variation in the inputs, we're pushing that, those inputs through this complicated chain of equations and a small variation in the inputs would lead to a nonlinear variation in the outputs. If we put a thousand different samples in, we get a distribution for each of the outputs at the end. This distribution might look like this, and we can take a mean value from that for our prediction, and we can take a standard deviation uh, as an error bar for that prediction. If this distribution is very broad, it means small variations in the inputs would lead to a very wide uh, variation in the output, and we're not to trust the, uh, the value. But if it's very narrow, the algorithm is confident that that value is correct. Let's apply Alchemite now to this uh, project data provided by Constellation. The initial project data we received, as Julian described, were two projects. Project A was completed, and that related to this histone acetyltransferase inhibitor project. Project B was ongoing and it recently commenced. This table summarizes the data we received from Constellation in the uh, onset of the project. We can see that A has a lot more compounds than B, as well as A having three biochemical activity endpoints and B having five biochemical activity endpoints. And both of these are about 50% filled. Project A has two cell-based activity endpoints, which are much less filled. So it's a rarer, more valuable uh, activities. 
we selected eight um, co-present uh, ADMI endpoints with the same definition that were shared between the two projects. For project A, which was complete, there was a lot more ADMI data. For project B, which had just started, there wasn't nearly as much, only 3% filled, very sparse data. In addition to this, we would receive further data as the project went on, which we could use for prospective validation. The objectives were to compare the accuracy of Alchemite to conventional QSAR models. Does Alchemite add value in the limit of a small data set? Deep learning has been promised to offer significant um, quality of prediction over normal machine learning methods, but this is usually only realized on large data sets with um, precise data. If we can prove that that works for a smaller, more project-based data set, that's going to be something very valuable. We also wanted to compare models built on all of the data simultaneously with individual um, sections of the data, whether that by, be by project or by data type. Can this method handle the complexity of different chemical space heterogeneous endpoints all in one single model that makes it very convenient to run. We also need to check that Alchemite's ability to estimate confidence in its predictions is still robust in the small data limit. In order to check these objectives, we built three types of model. We built an Alchemite model for the individual project data sets, one model for project A, one model for project B. We also built one model for both projects combined together um, where the ADMI data are shared between those two projects. In addition, we built four types of QSAR model for individual endpoints to compare against Alchemite. These included random forest, Gaussian processes, radial basis functions, and partial least squares, which represent a good variety of from simple to complex commonly used QSAR methods. If we take the mixed data set, the combined data set for Alchemite, and run it on all of the initial data with a 20% held out um, test set, we see the following picture of the uh, performances. So here we've got the R squared, which is the coefficient of determination. And that's been measured for each of the endpoints um, across all of the Project A activities, cell-based activities and the Project B by activities, as well as these eight uh, ADMI endpoints here. On average, the best QSAR method of the four gives a uh, R-squared of 0.44, whereas Alchemite gets an average R-squared of 0.65, which is already showing great promises, much better. Um, and we can see why if we look at these activities here. There's a huge increase in um, performance on some of these activities. And that's because Alchemite can take the sparse experimental data and look for correlations among that to uh, help support the prediction of new experimental endpoints. In particular, this cell-based activity from uh, Project A, the best QSAR method gets a negative R squared, which means it's worse than randomly shuffling the data up. Um, it's, it's worse than random. Alchemite has quite a good R-squared above 0.5 here. That's because Alchemite can use those correlations uh, to discern the model for a complex endpoint. The next study looked at the difference between a single model and uh, the combined models for Alchemite only. So this was to check stability. Um, and if you mix the two projects together, does the uh, quality of predictions remain the same? This appears to be the case, as these are almost exactly the same R-squareds for these two types of model, um, especially for these activities. And they're very similar for the ADMI properties. It should be noted that for the ADMI properties, uh, the definition of a single uh, project model was only using project A data. There's not enough uh, ADMI data in project B to build. Uh, a very good uh, model there. So that adds slightly more variation to this comparison. But in general, Alchemite models are stable. Uh, however you compartmentalize the data, you get a similar quality of model out. Now we can have a look at some uh, validation. This contains both the uh, held out test validation and a prospective validation for Project B Bioactivity 2. 
this is a plot against the observed PIC50 values for compounds in um, the x-axis against the predicted PIC50 by the alchemite method, along with the error bar, which is the alchemite error bar. In black, we have the test set from the initial data set, and we see that this is nicely distributed about the identity line y equals x. In orange, we have prospective test compounds, which were received after these models were built from Constellation. We can see on the right that newly, new active compounds from this prospective test set were correctly identified as active, which is really encouraging. The error bars on these compounds are overlapping with the identity line. We can also see that in the original test data, this outlier was correctly identified. Alchemite gave it a very large error bar compared to the other points. And that's because it's saying, don't trust this value, because uh, the observed value is quite different to the predicted value. Finally, for the prospective test set, we see this large cluster of inactives on the left here. At first, these appear wrong because they're not on the identity line. However, if we look at the training set in more detail, we find that there were no examples of compounds this inactive in that training set. Actually, the cutoff was about PIC50 of 4. So these were more inactive than anything Alchemite had seen, and it's correctly placed them on the inactive end of the spectrum and given them a slightly larger error bar to say it's less confident about those points. But this is a useful classification of these data points. This plot measures the uh, confidence we have in Alchemite's error bars and how robust those are. This is looking at if we focus in on the most confident predictions, do we see a decrease in the root mean squared error, which is an increase in accuracy, as you would expect if the error bars were correct. We do see that this is the case. Alchemite is the orange line on this plot. And on the far right side, which is predicting all of the data, um, at 100% prediction, we see then if we remove um, predicted points by their error bars to predict only the 80% most confident um, predictions, we get a decrease in the root mean squared error, um, which is what you'd expect to see. We also tried this randomly removing points, which gives the blue area here. And the fact that Alchemite is well outside of this random uh, area shows it is the error bars are better than random, much better than random. The theoretical optimums are these uh, dotted lines, but it's um, you'd have to cheat to get that or be very, uh, very good. <laughs> so Alchemite's closely following the theoretical optimum, which is encouraging. So our conclusions from this initial data set is that Alchemite is significantly outperforming the QSAR models, um, or is at least as good as the best QSAR model, but is often much better than uh, the best QSAR model. It performed well on both independent test sets and prospective test sets, um, and had consistent performance identifying actives and inactives correctly. The single Alchemite models um, were equivalent to um, one big model for both projects and that shows that we can combine data from different chemistries um, different types and endpoints all in one single model which is very convenient um, and we don't need to to worry about mixing irrelevant data together alchemite can focus on the most confident and accurate results which helps us know uh, and be confident in our predictions we can ignore results which have very large error bars um, and focus in on those which we know are accurate the next steps were to apply Alchemite um, as the project progressed, um, and this would require temporal validation. So at this stage, we received another 874 compounds um, for Project B from Constellation. Again, these are sparse results from real experiments, and there's a lot more ADME data now as the project has progressed. Um, we also received the order that these um, data, these compounds were registered in the database, and that allows us to arrange them in time order, um, and we split into three blocks. So we could build a model on the original training and test data, which is the earliest data, 
and we could also build a second model on on that original data and the first temporal block and we can build a third model on the original data and the first two blocks and we can test all three of those models on the final block because that final block represents the the latest most relevant um, data in the project so this is nice temporal validation and the results from that can be seen in these plots here on the left we've got the average coefficient of determination across all of the endpoints for models one two and three with increasing data from left to right we can see a steady increase in the coefficient of determination which shows the models are making good use of that increased data um, on the right we've got the breakdown for those models uh, again with model one two and three from left to right and you can see that even on the first model there are a number of very accurate endpoints um, by the second model many of those endpoints are, are getting above this threshold of 0 0.7 which is a very good model and by the third model almost all of the endpoints are, are above that that line uh, or very good models so it's working well in a temporal setting let's look into an, a few examples of these um, one is the uh, ADME endpoint of human plasma protein binding and we're predicting block three and we've got models one two and three arranged from left to right so we've predicted the log it uh, plasma protein binding so it's a transform on the percentage but this cluster of compounds in the bottom left are weakly binding compounds and these four compounds in the top right are strongly over binding um, compounds so in this initial model one although the r squared is quite good if we look at alchemite's error bars on those predictions we can't confidently discern the two clusters from each other but by adding only 19 more training examples we begin to see the error bars shrinking down and the points moving further away and we can begin to separate these two clusters at model three we can confidently see barely any overlap in those error bars and we can uh, correctly identify overbinding from uh, moderately binding compounds we can also look at an example in terms of activity again predicting block three the final block uh, for models one two and three um, and this is this bioactivity two PIC 50 the R squared of model one is very good um, but we see there's room for improvement on the very far end of inactives and the the most active compounds there with only true 208 examples in the training set as we add more and more data the models get exceptionally good the final model has R squared of 0 0.93 and we can see that the uh, algorithm is, is very confident at these active compounds here on the right assigning them very small error bars so it's confidently um, discerning uh, moderate actives from strong actives if we look at the distribution of the training set in terms of activity we see there are fewer examples of very active compounds and the algorithm is doing quite a good job of extrapolating into the active uh, regime there providing just slightly larger error bars for those uh, most active compounds there but correctly classifying them again there's very few examples of these inactives which is why we see a much larger error bar on, on those there finally we can rebuild um, an equivalent uh, comparison between QSAR and Alchemite now with this uh, increased quantity of data once again we can perform a 20 percent uh, independent test set and check those R squareds the QSAR average has gone from 0.44 to 0.5 showing QSAR has improved with the additional data as one might expect but we can see that Alchemite has also kept that gap and improved uh, from 0.65 to 0.72 very encouraging it's continuing to make great use of that additional data and we can see the breakdown again over uh, activities cell-based activities and bioactivities for B as well as the ADME endpoints there's now five of these uh, activities which are of R squared above 0.9 exceptionally good models and we can see that Alchemite is is always better than the uh, leading QSAR method if not equivalent in terms of ADME properties um, in order to probe that idea further that the algorithm is making better use of data we rebuilt 
50 or so models um, using different slices, um, different numbers of training data points, and smooth that scatter plot into these curves here. So what this is showing is if my endpoint on average has 100 or 200, 300 training data points, what proportion of these endpoints have an R squared above a certain threshold, with those thresholds being 0.5 in light and 0.7 in, in a thick line, and we can see that with only 100 data points, um, Alchemite already has 30% of the endpoints um, with R squared greater than 0.6. Um, Random Forest doesn't have any um, of the endpoints above 0.7 for any of these numbers of data points. And it's only for very large numbers of data points, 500 to 700, that we begin to see a significant uh, proportion of Random Forest models even getting R squareds above 0.5 whereas Alchemite is confidently making use of that data. Um, it's got exceptional models. It's got sort of 40%, more than 40% greater than 0.7 at that point. So Alchemite is making great use of the data at all times. In conclusion, Alchemite is solving those four cases that I uh, talked about at the beginning. It's a practical application of deep learning for the task of imputation um, and it's handling this missing data and sparse data sets. It's providing robust uncertainty estimates on its predictions. And you can train a single model for all data types simultaneously. That's heterogeneous data, different chemical spaces, different projects. Um, it also holds up to time and temporal validation, and it gets better with time, making better use of the data points you give to it. Alchemite can focus in on the most confident and accurate results, um, and the models improve as, as data is added in this realistic chronological project setting for this real data. So we're very pleased with the performance of Alchemite in this uh, model. The final thing we're going to cover is a much larger application of Alchemite. This project uh, was a collaboration with Takeda Pharmaceuticals, um, and it's an application to a very large data set with almost three quarters of a million compounds, and in terms of columns in the data matrix, 3,568 columns. Um, these endpoints are from different um, assays, where assays can have more than one column. And that matrix is less than 1% complete when we receive it. Um, these endpoints cover a full range of drug discovery assays from uh, activities, high throughput activities through to higher resolution activities, as well as all kinds of ADME properties and physical chemical properties. We can see a breakdown of the, uh, the quality of prediction, again measured in R squared for each of those endpoints arranged from best on the uh, left through to worst on the right. We see the R squared of the 500 worst um, assays aren't predicted well by either method of Alchemite or Random Forest. But for the best assays, Alchemite's offering much better quality models than Random Forest here, with a median R squared of 0.5 compared to Random Forest only getting 0.19 here. So all of the area between these two curves could be thought of the value added by using Alchemite in this, uh, on this data set. And we're going to delve into much more detail on that um, that uh, project on a, a webinar scheduled in May, 26th of May. So please have a look out for that if you're interested in knowing about large applications. That's the end of uh, my talk here, so I'm going to hand back to Matt now. Many thanks, Ben. That's a, a great presentation. Um, and we're going to move on to Q&A in a minute. Um, I can already see there are several questions coming in, which is fantastic. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we thought it might be good to hear from Julian again um, about how the results of this study actually impacted uh, on their project. Um, obviously, we understand there are limitations in the details you can share. Um, but, but Julian, maybe you could share some non-proprietary examples of, of how you found these uh, methods to be useful. Oh, sorry, man. I just clicked past. Um, yeah, as you say, unfortunately, we can't go into structures, and there were some specific examples which were quite interesting. But I think if you if you take a step back 
and look from the, the 20,000 foot level as it were, was there anything overarching without actually going into too much details? Um, one of the first things that I'm pointing out here is, is the confidence in deprioritizing the synthesis of new target molecules. And what I mean by that is that um, when you look at compounds that were predicted to be active, in that pool of compounds there was a, quite a mix of compounds that were active, inactive in reality. And as Ben showed, it gets better over time. But what was something that was really useful was looking not that necessarily at that pool, but at the pool of compounds that were inactive, predicted to be inactive, and actually showed up to be inactive. Obviously, in any program, you're making compounds on or in order to test your hypothesis. You may have structural information. You're pushing against a protein, see if a side chain will move out of the way, etc. So there's a number of those things that you make on purpose that you expect to be inactive. And those, in general, might be outside of the SAR of your um, training set, as it were. And so a lot of those compounds ended up with quite low confidence in the predictions. But when you look at the confidence in combination with the SAR and the chemical space of the training set and look at the compounds that were predicted to be inactive, there's quite a number of compounds that we were making that we probably didn't need to make. Um, overall, I've got a number here, 10 to 20 percent. That's probably an overestimate of how many compounds we made because there was a number of compounds in there that were, for example, um, inactive chiral enantiomers. And so I'll come back to that point in, the, in a little bit. But um, even if you're fairly conservative and look at that, as Ben mentioned, we had uh, eight or 900 compounds that we made and shared the data as the project was progressing. At the, at, towards the end of the program, we also made an additional 200 or so compounds. So overall, there was over a 1,000 new molecules we made. You can probably say that at least 50 to 60 molecules there didn't need to be made, probably over 100. Um, that doesn't sound like a massive impact necessarily unless you're a synthetic chemist. You're probably looking at 12 FTEs for a couple of months with the types of, of complexity of molecules that we were making on this program. So you can definitely apply that resource somewhere else. You could either save the money or you can use that effort making more high priority molecules or higher probability compounds. So that was actually a pretty useful finding, I think, and something that I expect would be translated across multiple programs here. Um, another interesting point was identifying outliers in measured data sets. Um, ben showed one example there, which was an outlier. It was a low confidence outlier. You quite often see high confidence outliers. Um, what does that mean? Um, sometimes the measured data is wrong. You have an empty well or you have a compound that was dissolved up incorrectly and it hasn't got the concentration, there was some impurity in there, etc. Maybe the compound's decomposed over time and you see assay data that doesn't necessarily correlate with your understanding of the SAI. I think we've all probably seen that in doing MedChem programs. What was interesting here was that the method quite often highlights those molecules. Um, and so you can interrogate that. You can retest the molecule in the assay to make sure that it was real data and it was correct, or sometimes not. Or you can look at the analogs of those molecules and see whether or not that was real. We actually found in the HAP program, again, this was, this was after the fact because those molecules are already made and all the data was somewhat sealed and delivered before the program, before this collaboration. But there was a number of molecules in one subseries that were predicted to have really good permeability, but the measured data was very poor. And when you dig a little bit further, you realize that there was analogs in there that were measured with great permeability. And so those were predicted to be good, and they should have been good. And when you go back into the, to the original data, you realize that there was poor uh, recovery in some cases, or the molecule wasn't stable, or the molecule wasn't um, in the same concentration as it should have been. So in those cases, you could imagine you deprioritize either a single molecule that looks good for every other property space, or you might deprioritize a subseries for further in investigation, and that would be a bad thing because you're basing that, even though you're basing it on measured data, not predicted data, you're basing it on incorrect data. Um, 
So I, I, I'll leave it there, I think. Um, what was interesting, one other just quick uh, point was on the identification in the data sets of the cell-based data being the one that Alchemite predicted pretty well versus a lot of the individual models. As Ben mentioned, it's, it's looking at correlations between all the different assays, such as permeability assays, that may make sense to why those compounds were then better predicted using a, um, a, the Alchemite method. But we also had in the HAP program multiple mechanisms of inhibition. And some of those mechanisms of inhibition translated well into the cell, and some of them did not. And it was clear that the, the, the individual models don't predict that very well, but the alchemite models seem to handle those different mechanisms of inhibition and took them in its stride, which was quite interesting. So um, I would just mention a couple of caveats. Obviously, in any of these situations, where you, where you have the ADME, it looks like that might translate across, across multiple programs. Obviously, the, the models are going to be slightly better if you're predicting it within the, the chemotype that you're working. But they have pretty good prediction across programs. And so the ADME models were, were, were nice because the HAT data helped us predict the data for the other undisclosed target. The, um, the activity data, obviously, you need to have some in the initial portion of the training because 20 compounds isn't going to give you enough data to be able to be accurate or confident in the predictions of the potency. But um, yeah, I mean, that's just where, where you are. You need a, probably 100 or 200 compounds before you start to see some reasonable prediction on the activity side. The other thing that was interesting from our data sets was when we shared the, the, the compound data, we, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't share the structures. And the descriptors didn't include a description of the chirality of any of the molecules. So when you look back at the data in detail, it doesn't distinguish between the R or the S or between different diastereomers very well because, as you can imagine, it was not in the original data set. In general, you see somewhat averaging of, of those differential um, activities. And I, you can add some of those descriptors. Obviously, if you include those descriptors in the original training sets, then that would, we feel, improve that, and that's something that's worthwhile looking at. The only problem that we had of not doing that in some of our data sets is quite often a lot of the compounds we've made um, without knowing the absolute stereochemistry. And so you test, you may contest all of the enantiomers, and the ones that are active at some point in the program, you understand whether it was one isomer or one enantiomer that was the key, and then you either synthesize just that enantiomer, or you still do the, the, the synthesis of racemic mixtures or and then to, uh, diastereomeric mixtures and separate and test. And in those cases, quite often the compounds are registered into the database prior to knowledge of the activity or the absolute stereochemistry. So this is just a caveat that, that it's going to be complicated to have that unless you know absolutely what the, what the stereochemistry is up front. But presumably this is something which we could, could control for or add into the data set. So I think that was all I could disclose right now. Hopefully we'll be able to pull some more information into the public domain as, as time goes on, especially with the, with the program we haven't disclosed yet, because that I think is with all the iterative aspects of it and the temporal data sets was where the, the real value is. Okay, back over to, to Matt. Thank you very much, Julian. That, that's fantastic. And, and thanks for just giving us a sort of that, that high level overview. Um, I think just to emphasize, you're, you're absolutely right in terms of the chirality, the, the choice of descriptors that we made in this case didn't capture stereochemical effects. But, of course, as you rightly point out, they could easily be added in um, and used. Uh, Alchemite can use any sorts of descriptors that you want. Um, there's no limitations there in particular. It's also great to see that that confidence information is having so much value. You know, we would expect to see that a very confidently predicted inactive, as you see, would show fo few false negatives. So you can um, confidently discard that compound and, uh, and, and not waste your time and effort making and testing it. And then finally, uh, this is a great point that you make here as about um, sort of you see, like almost a quality control application to the experimental data. Because you have a probability distribution for each of the predictions, if your, um, if your measure data is, is sort of way out on the tail of that probability distribution, that would suggest that based on all the other evidence for all the other compounds in your project or in your, your corporate database, that that looks very unlikely. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. 
uh, but it does mean that it would be very interesting SAR if, if that were to be the case, and, and perhaps you should you know, validate that finding uh, before you rely on it too heavily in making decisions for your projects. Again, you don't want to miss opportunities due to incorrectly measured data. So um, with that, uh, we can move on to the sort of uh, uh, one last slide here just to talk about, if you're interested, how you can find out more um, on our website and uh, optibrium.com or augmentedchemistry.ai. Um, Augmented Chemistry is our uh, new platform, uh, really, where we're trying to combine both human expertise and these um, artificial intelligence algorithms, these advanced sort of machine learning methods to give the best possible combination. Um, we're working in collaboration with several organizations applying uh, this method to their projects and data on an ongoing basis. Um, I think we've just about completed six projects now. We have several more that are just about to get started um, doing things like you know, filling in the gaps in your database. So you can bring all of the compounds and, and data and use this imputation approach to fill in uh, all that extra information that you can mine to find high quality compounds with e estimates of the confidence in each value. Um, that helps to find the most valuable compounds and also the most important experiments to perform. Where would that experimental data add the most value? Or indeed you could use this to run virtual screens to find new starting points. So if you're interested in that, please do get in touch with us. We'll be happy to sort of discuss your project and data with you, understand uh, what you want to achieve, and, and provide a proposal on how we could, we could help you with those goals. All righty, so uh, we're now on to the Q&A session. I can see we've got uh, lots of questions already have, that have already come in. Um, just to give you a little reminder, if you haven't asked a question yet and, and want to, um, then you will find the control panel for uh, Go to webinar where you can type in some additional questions um, and we will go through those and address as many of them as we can in the remaining time. Um, so while people are still typing in those questions, um, I might just sort of throw to you, Ben, for a second um, and, and just say, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about the status of this research and, and where people can find out more? Thanks, Matt. Um, yes, of course, there's there's lots of um, ongoing research here, and as with all good scientific research, we are publishing papers where we can on this. So there's obviously the two papers I pointed to before, um, the JCIM and the Future Drug Discovery one, um, but we also we, we have a preprint um, that we could offer for this, a write-up of, of this work. Um, and that's going through the review process now. So I think we could send uh, a link round to people for that, that work. Um, and then there's numerous other projects like the one that we showed, the Takeda one that we're going to talk about in the future with, with webinars and future uh, research coming out there. Wonderful. Th thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so if you're interested in receiving a preprint um, of the paper, as, as, as Ben says, it's, it's currently just finalizing the review process. Um, please do get in touch, just info at optibrium.com. Uh, we'll send you a, a preprint hot off the press. And, and I think actually that that will answer many of the questions I can see here in the Q&A panel. So uh, without further ado, let me move over to my other screen here for a second, and, and let's have a look uh, at some of these uh, questions. Um, so uh, I can see lots of them. Um, in particular, let's just starting with the, the technical side of things. Um, there was a couple of questions actually that are very, very similar uh, about the actual alchemite method. Um, and, and basically they boil down to, uh, you described how we use, or Alchemite uses the sort of uh, average value for a column to sort of fill in the blanks as the initial input to this iterative process. Uh, and there were a couple of questions saying, well, um, instead of using the average value, could you find, say, the, the most similar compound in the data set and use that, or, or maybe use, a, 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 I guess another approach would be some sort of k-nearest neighbors approach. Um, are, are there cases where that might be better than just using the average? Hello. Yep. Um, that sounds like a good idea. Yep. There's a number of um, classical forms of imputation and imputation via the mean and imputation via the nearest element or k-nearest neighbors. 
or even some dubious methods like filling in the previous value um, have all been tried out and, and those are all definitely um, possible um, to implement with this, this kind of work. Obviously, um, if you think about a differentiable algorithm, um, K nearest neighbors uh, kind of implies sorting and I know um, Google research have, have recently done a differentiable sorting algorithm, but that's still in its infancy, as it were, and it's it's going to add a lot of cost to building algorithms with that in there. Um, but if, if it was the non-differentiable tree, that would definitely be implementable via the expectation maximization type um, of stuff. Um, it's definitely a good idea. Uh, we haven't looked into uh, that avenue yet. Yeah, absolutely. And, and essentially, I think that as the Alchemite algorithm iterates, essentially, it's using that information about proximity, both in descriptor space and in this sort of sparse assay space to sort of converge um, on, on more and more accurate results. So it, it might be, I guess, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, a, a way to sort of precondition the input to some extent. Um, but, but ultimately, I suspect that once you reach convergence, it's going to give you a very, very similar answer. That, that does sound about right. If you think about the layer of a, a neural network creating um, an embedding for the next layer, you could imagine that in that next embedding, the, the neighboring points are already very close um, to, to the new value. So yeah, that, that could be interpreted in that way. Um, Great. Thanks a lot. Um, so and the next question. Uh, since Alchemite uses neural network, how interpretable are the results? Um, can you give practical advice about specific changes to make in a molecule um, regarding uh, well, any endpoint, I guess, target activity or, or admet properties? Right. So, um, as always, deep learning is a trade-off between power and performance and interpretability. Um, the nice thing is is that because it's an ensemble method and you think about squeezing these samples through the network, in a sense, that's also a sensitivity analysis. Um, so the, un the uncertainties can be treated as, as uh, how sensitive that, that data point would be to, to variation. Um, so in terms of generative methods, you can definitely use the network and those uncertainties to, um, to search for, for new compounds. Um, you could do a bit of differential back propagation to try and maximize properties, um, things like that. It, it's, it's all viable. Absolutely. And, and as you say, I think with that sort of sensitivity analysis, it gives you an importance of each input and a uh, sort of a directionality. And so actually, depending on your descriptors, mapping that back onto the structure of the compound is, is certainly very feasible. Uh, many of the people in the audience will be familiar with our glowing molecule visualization. Um, and so although, to be clear, we haven't yet implemented this with Alchemite, uh, a similar approach to interpretation of the results would, would certainly be possible. All right, so uh, here's a, a bit of a technical question uh, about the split between training and test set. Um, and uh, what is the diversity in the chemical series um, as you explore these, uh, these two different projects that you've been speaking about? Right, well, um, I can tell you for sure that the upcoming publication for this project has a lot of details on this kind of analysis um, in the supplementary information. Um, and it was very interesting to go through that. Um, so for each of the endpoints, you get quite a different picture. Um, so there were quite a few series across the both of the projects together, something like uh, 15, maybe 20 series, um, along with a lot of miscellaneous compounds. Um, and obviously, yes, if you're doing a temporal validation, you've got to check whether it's essentially if all of the, the, the latest data down the line were all from a particular series and that series was well represented by the algorithm, it would be unfair to claim that it it's, uh, holds up to temporal validation um, because you've got to deconvolute those two concepts. But I can tell you when we looked and we plotted chemical spaces for each of the endpoints, uh, we looked at the uncertainty distribution and we looked at the uh, temporal analysis in chemical space, and that didn't seem to be the case. It was equally represented um, 
obviously uh, a few series were carried on towards the end of the project um, but it wasn't one series dominating that, that was very that performed very well um, great I can comment as well if you like Matt um, great yeah, it's exactly right. Obviously, the data sets we shared included all of our validated hits from our original screen. So that was a very diverse set of molecules across multiple different scaffolds. Um, we honed in on in each program on a much smaller set of series that we moved forward. But during the, 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 the iterative program, we were maintaining a number of different series in, in parallel because we weren't sure at that point. This is mostly through the hit to lead phase of that project. So obviously, we hadn't honed in on any one particular series at that point, although a couple of series did look more in, interesting to us. And so we were shifting our resources. And maybe there was a slight bias there. But in general, we were maintaining multiple series through all of that process. Great, thank you very much. That, that's really helpful to, to get that background, Julian. Um, so I, I'm just very aware we have a, a very large number of questions here. And uh, technically speaking, we've just uh, run over the allotted time for the webinar. Uh, we're very happy to stay on the line. We'll continue to answer questions uh, for at least a little bit longer. Uh, but if we don't get back to you uh, or are, don't have time to answer you during the webinar, uh, we will follow up by email and, and make sure that we address all of your questions. But uh, for now, at least, let me sort of uh, ask a, a few more that are out there. Um, and actually, this one, uh, Ben, sounds really interesting. It's perhaps addressed by our earlier paper in um, Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling. But uh, how well can Alchemite predict if the Tanamoto similarity is small compared to compounds in the training set? Right. So this is that age-old question of um, extrapolation versus interpolation um, and yes we we did do some analysis on this algorithm on um, a more homogeneous data set uh, that was in the the 2019 publication there but um, it performs very well so all algorithms find it hard to extrapolate into unknown space and and I guess the, the Tanamoto similarity being small uh, represents um, that there um, unless there's some kind of global trend, um, you're always going to move away from things you've seen before. But we found that Alchemite compared very favorably to other methods in terms of that extrapolation case um, in a specifically designed test set where the test set were the outliers from the training set, which, which by definition, their, their Tanamoto similarity should be um, small compared with the training set there. And although you don't see the, the, the very large R squareds that you would expect from um, representative compounds like 0.9s, uh, you do see uh, high R squareds like 0.4, um, where other methods such as standard deep neural networks get 0.1, and methods such as random forest get negative R squareds because they can't extrapolate at all because it's, it's pure interpolation. So it does perform very favorably. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and I think that's one of the advantages of, of imputation is because in some senses you're not only uh, looking in chemical space, but also in admittedly very sparse biological space. You can capture a, an awful lot of signal um, that, that, that might be lost in the extrapolation in chemical space. So, um, so yes, again, if you have a look at the, uh, uh, the Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling paper, uh, there, there's, it's quite a nice... Uh, test set that was actually constructed by Novartis explicitly to test this extrapolation potential. Uh, there's a couple of questions here uh, just asking about the descriptors that we use. So um, uh, why don't I just take that one? Um, so the descriptors we used in, in this particular uh, project were the descriptors from our Stardrop Auto Modeler. Um, they are fairly standard things. Um, so whole molecule properties like log P, molecular weight, McGowan's volume, polar surface area, charge, flexibility, etc. plus approximately 300 2D structure-based descriptors, essentially represented as counts of smarts. Again, all the details are in, in the paper that we're publishing, um, uh, but we're not talking about any special descriptors here. Um, indeed, Alchemite can take anything that you wish as input. And in particular, one of the things we'd like to explore was highlighted by Julian, which is the potential to take 
sort of 3D and stereochemical information into account uh, as well. So uh, it's a question about sort of type of data. So uh, what would be the minimum amount of data to build a model? Um, so essentially thinking about the applicability for sort of early stage projects. So in our experience, um, 100 data points is, a, is at least a milestone to say you can expect decent models um, to come out. If you start to go into the, the low tens, it's going to be very hard to get um, a really good model just because there's, there's not much signal there. Um, the, and if you have more than that, obviously you, it will do a great job generally because um, lots of algorithms, you know, using a lot of data is, 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 is the, good, the good place to be. So uh, in terms of exploiting correlations, if you have related activities, for example, and each of them has 100 data points, um, it does depend on, to some extent, on the overlap between those um, distributions. Because if you if you measure one activity for every other compound, and there's no overlap, then it's not going to be able to exploit those correlations. Um, so it does get a bit technical there. Um, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. That 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 that's great. I mean, as with all things, the the more data you have, the better it gets. But it actually is, as Ben showed in uh, in one of his final slides it learns from small amounts of data much more quickly than conventional QSAR methods. You probably remember the slides with the sort of orange region and the blue region comparing uh, alchemite with, with QSAR methods. Um, right, another great question. It's not something we really address specifically uh, in this project, but is one that we have a, a very detailed analysis of in the next presentation on the 26th of May. Just put a plug in there. Um, is the imputation method possible to predict new compounds which are not included in the sparse matrix? So essentially virtual compounds, I guess, or, or, or new compounds that haven't been included in the input data. Yeah, this is a, a great question, and it does come up a fair amount, and it, it's it's true. We we have a major use case of predicting uh, virtual compounds that there are definitely not any experimental data for. So there is a way of doing this with alchemite that is, is quite clever. Um, there's essentially two types of alchemite model you can train. Um, there's the one that we went through in this presentation, which says, you know, train on a training set with experimental data that it's sparse, and you can expect to receive experimental data with new predictions. That's a more of an imputation model, but you can also train a so-called virtual model where you tell it at train time not to expect any more um, experimental data at test time. So that uh, condition on the training of the model does come out with a slightly different model uh, slightly different hyperparameters, and it, it does a better job at virtual predictions. Um, we've generally shown that that is better than, if not, uh, at least uh, equal to, if not better than, um, most QSAR methods. Um, and that is, again, offers you uncertainties, all the same, and it is the most confident points that are often the most interesting ones to look for in the virtual screen. Maybe I could comment here again, Matt, because obviously we didn't talk about it today, but there was that final phase of the collaboration where we had an extra, I think it was 250 compounds that we hadn't made, but we would have designed, as well as a couple of hundred extra compounds that your models had never seen, and we put those through your Alchemite model as well. Since that point, we made an extra 60 or 70 of those designed ideas, and, and again, I think there's obviously some in there that were predicted poorly because they're way outside of the of the training set but in general it did a very good job of predicting which ones are in the in the active the very active and the and the inactive pools so <clears throat> that's that's information obviously we we can we can hopefully dig into in the future but it's um yeah it was useful yeah that that's great that thanks a lot, a lot julian um, okay, so there's another great question here, which again is something uh, addressed in a previous uh, in our previous publication, but is very important to uh, address. Which is, have we used any multitask modeling um, 
to compare with alchemite? Yes, is the, the one word answer. Um, but yeah, you're right that um, the QSAR models in this study were individual endpoints and it is uh, only fair to compare multitask models against alchemite because alchemite is a multitask model um, and we have indeed compared it. So there's um, at least deep neural networks, a standard deep neural network um, I've trained one in the JCIM 2019 paper um, and that, although it did a good job, it was better than random um, for that tough test set, uh, it, it did nowhere near as well as um, Alchemite. So there's still an extra benefit from the imputation framework be beyond the multitask um, element there as well. And actually the difference between single uh, task and multitask models wasn't that large um, for that particular set. Fantastic. Well, I, I'm very grateful to so many people for staying on so so far past the the allotted time. Uh, let me just go a couple more people I can still see are online uh, with specific questions. So let's see if we can we can address those. Um, so, uh, how often do we need to retrain uh, based on new data? I'd say as. as as often as you like is, is the, the obvious one. It's quite, for smaller models especially, it's quite quick to retrain the Alchemite model. Um, and if you, if you get a few more data points, you, you can see these, uh, these large changes. For example, that um, plasma protein binding example we went through, only 19 data points did make quite a big difference because um, we were going from 100 um, compounds to sort of 120. Um, but yeah, if, if you don't want to retrain all the time, you could do it in, in blocks of, of tens of, of uh, results. Um, but if, if you have the capacity to retrain um, often, then, then, then you can do it. It's... Absolutely. And, and I think it's probably uh, giving you a little look forward, but we'll be talking about this in more detail, is that... Uh, uh, while we're offering this at the moment as a collaborative um, sort of uh, platform, um, we are developing a, a uh, software platform that will sort of help to automate this and make that sort of retraining process sort of seamless and happen in the background as new data becomes available uh, so that it will not be something you have to sort of manually do uh, on a regular basis, but, but actually will just give you the latest predictions based on the latest data as they become available. Right. Um, so another great question here. Um, so there was one biological endpoint. It was one of the cell-based assays uh, where all of the QSAR models are worse than random. Uh, what's so special about that? Why, why is it so bad, I guess, is the question. I think, um, like, I, like I said um, a minute ago, one of, one of the aspects there, I think, is probably the fact that you're incorporating the ADME permeability and solubility criteria. But in, in that particular project, you also have the different mechanisms of inhibition, where some of those mechanisms of inhibition, of, which showed up biochemically, but didn't show up in a cell, they didn't translate well. So that's, I think from, from our perspective, that was one of the underlying pieces or multiple of the underlying rationales. I don't know that there's anything beyond that. They, they, one of the cell assays was a PD readout and one of the cell assays was a efficacy readout. So you were looking at growth effects versus uh, direct effect as well. So you might argue that there was other other activities, but the compounds were very clean. So it's, um, yeah, I think it was the mechanism of inhibition which also added the complexity there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, th thanks for that. That's really good to get that insight because I, I think very often when we're trying to model these sort of multi-mechanistic properties um, where we have uh, diff multiple contributions to you know, cell-based assays particularly, um, it's very hard for a QSAR model based on a limited amount of data to dissect the structural influences on all those different factors and then combine them into a prediction of the overall um, you know, cell-based sort of phenotypic result. Um, and again, that's where this beauty of being able to learn directly from the correlations between all of these ADME and um, uh, you know, biochemical effects to, to work out which ones of those strongly influence uh, that particular uh, more complex endpoint. And I'd, I'd add to that the, the deep learning, that's its specialty, 
because the QSAR methods, if you've got a linear method, it's never going to be able to pick up that kind of um, th those kinds of features in the descriptors. It's only the non highly non-linear methods that will be able to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Well, uh, there are still a few outstanding questions, but um, uh, I think we've we've addressed uh, the vast majority of them. Uh, apologies for those of you who asked more questions that we haven't yet answered, but uh, I don't want to outstay our welcome. So we will get back to you by email as soon as possible if we haven't addressed the question that you've asked. Um, so let me just give you a very quick reminder for the still a large number of you actually online, thank you very much, that we have another webinar on the 12th of May looking at a completely different area. Uh, here we'll be looking at work we're doing as part of the eTransafe consortium, uh, looking at uh, data visualization uh, in translational toxicology. Um, this is by uh, our colleagues Ashleen Cook and, and Ed Champness. Um, and also just a reminder, on the 26th of May we'll be talking about another application of Alchemite as uh, ben mentioned to a much larger data set of over 700,000 compounds and 3,500 endpoints to show the, the other end of the, the, the spectrum, the much larger scale sort of applications. Uh, so that just leaves me to say thank you very much. Um, we will be putting a recording of the full webinar on the community website at optibroom.com slash community, and we'll let you know where that's available. You're very welcome to share that with your colleagues or refresh your memory. And if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to contact us at info at optibrium.com and we'll be very happy to, to follow up and, and answer any other questions after the fact. So thank you all very much. Uh, have a good rest of your day and we look forward to hearing from you again soon. Bye-bye.